on? All right, we're going to give just a few minutes and then we'll get started in a little bit. Uh, so hopefully you guys are having a good day so far. How many of you guys, raise your hands if you're a father out there. All right, well, happy Father's Day to all of you guys. Like I said, we'll give it just a few minutes, let people catch up, and then uh, we'll get started in our worship. Who's our song leader today? Is it Randy? Ephraim's our song leader? Randy's our song leader. Okay, I thought you said Ephraim's our song leader. I was like, oh, that's new. Yeah. Good deal. All right. So we're just going to wait just for a few minutes, let this make sure it loads up and everything, get settled in, and then uh, we'll get started in our worship time. But I'm glad to see you guys today. Good morning, brethren. Good to see you today. Happy Father's Day to all fathers in here as we join and worship our Father in Heaven. Our first song will be 991 if you'd like to follow along in the songbook, 991. We'll sing the three verses of this song and then we'll take time out. Uh, Brother Ephraim, I believe, has our... our updates and announcements, etc. Uh, after this song. <clears throat> this is my Father's world, and to 
my listening ears. All nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, is and the wonders wrought. This is my Father's world. The birds their carols raise. The morning light, the lily white, declare their Maker's praise. This is my Father's world. I rest me in the thought of rustling grass. I hear him as he speaks to me everywhere. This is my Father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems all so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be one. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Randy kind of stole my opening line. I was going to go up here and say that I really don't look like Jess. I'm probably not as funny as he is, but that's all right. <laughs> Happy Father's Day to all our fathers that we have here today. Um, what a wonderful day. I have a bunch of scriptures I want to read. I just looked them up this morning. I was thinking about what I was going to say, and I just saw all these scriptures that I pulled up, and it's, uh, it's pretty quick. Just bear with me. Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline uh, and instruction of the Lord. Proverbs 1, 8 says, Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teachings. 2 Corinthians 6, 18. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Psalms 103, 13 says, As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Proverbs 22, 6, 6. Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Ah, I love that one. 2 Samuel 7, 14 through 15. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. When he does wrong, I will I'll discipline him in the usual ways, the pitfalls and obstacles of this mortal life, but I'll never remove my gracious love from him. What a wonderful verse. Proverbs 23, 22. Listen to your father who gave you life, and do not despise your mother when she is old. Proverbs 23, 24. The father of a righteous child has great joy. A man whose fathers, who fathers a wise son rejoices in him. Psalms 32, 7 through 8. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. And Proverbs 4, 11 through 12, I will guide you in the way of wisdom, and I will lead you in upright paths when you walk. Your steps will not be hampered, and when you run, you will not stumble. Those are all awesome scriptures and good uh, lessons for us to remember as we raise our children, our sons and daughters. I just have a couple of things, don't have a whole lot. Uh, all our visitors that are here with us this morning, if you are visiting, we're, we're so happy to have you. Uh, you're welcome and, and welcome to come back uh, at any time. We're happy to have you. We're able to love on you a little bit. You're not doing a lot of the hugging and stuff like that because obvious, for obvious reasons, the COVID is still around. And so we're trying to kind of keep everybody as safe as we can. But uh, we will love on you at a from a distance, not too far away, but we'll still love on you. Uh, so come back and visit us as many times as you'd like. Have a couple of things here. Jean, Jim and Frankie Cox's daughter 
Cynthia, who is an ICU nurse uh, in San Antonio. Uh, which they would like for us to pray for her safety as well as uh, all of the COVID patients. There's a lot of stuff going on in San Antonio right now. From what I understand, it is the fourth uh, city, the fourth uh, largest city in, in San Antonio, or it's in fourth place as far as COVID cases are concerned. It's doubling every 16 days from what we understand right now. There's been a second comeback of COVID, so it's a bad situation. I think Austin comes in at number five. Uh, there's a note here that says, if there's someone that has not been here in a while, take time to call and check on them. Um, and I just got that a bit ago. So yeah, there's, there's uh, people that haven't been here in quite a while. So it is up to us to kind of call out, reach out to them, and, and make sure that they're okay, and make sure that they have not been forgotten. Am I in the church? <laughs> and, uh, and I think that would be uh, a good thing. Uh, for them to hear, they know that they have not been forgotten, that they, we're still thinking about them and praying for them. Also, Larry Fagley, and who is Kelly Fagley's mom, I don't know if you know her, but she uh, is a member here, or was a former member, she's still part of our family, and had passed away, her dad passed away, so let's keep them in their prayers. Also, Karen Fry's mom passed away, so let's keep her and the family in prayers as well. And I believe, I have something here from Linda that was, um, oh, the, the Leonard's, or the, the Leonard's, the Polars, I'm sorry. <laughs> Leonard and, and, and Claire Polar have become great grandparents, and Don and Kelly have become grandparents, grandparents, great grandparents and grandparents. That's awesome. I love grandkids. I got six. Uh, also, Miguelina Olivares is asking for prayers from the church, so let's keep them in prayers as well. And we have a couple of new church members, Matias and Danae, H10, that are here with the, the Ramirez's. So if you have a chance to say hi to them, don't forget about them. They're sitting over there. Welcome to church here. Welcome to our family. I'm glad you're here. And let's not forget our normal people that we're constantly praying for, that uh, they continue to need prayers, and that's what we're here for, Malcolm and, and Marvin and uh, Alex, I'm sure, is still in need of prayers. So let's pray for all these folks and anyone else that you can remember to pray for. Let's do it. Prayer is always a great thing, and it accomplishes many things. And so um, with that said, I think I've got everything. Thank you for being here. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers that we have. Happy Grandfather's Day. I don't know if there's the Grandfather's Day, but happy Great Grandfather's Day as well. These guys are... I know excited about being a new grandparent and a new great grandparent. So thank you so much. Happy Father's Day. Will you pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, as we come here this morning, uh, we, we pray a prayer of thanksgiving, uh, a prayer to honor our ultimate Father, you, Lord. Uh, what a wonderful thing you have done for us to give us this opportunity to be here this morning, to worship you, uh, to pray to you, uh, and to glorify your name. Father, we've mentioned many this morning that need your help, uh, that are suffering, uh, that uh, are, are sick or injured or just, just not doing well. Uh, we pray that you would be with them. Uh, there's nothing better than to have your healing hand upon them. Uh, and their families, uh, to be with them and to comfort them during these hard times. Uh, we pray especially for our church leaders, our elders, our deacons. Uh, we pray uh, that you'd be with Tim and his family. Uh, they, they all have a, a difficult job uh, to, to lead us and to support us during these, these times. And we pray that your healing hands and protection be upon them. Father, we live in perilous times. Uh, we have many, many things that are going on both here uh, and uh, around the nation. We pray that you would be with our nation, uh, be with our people, that we bring peace uh, to this nation. And it's just such a, just a difficult time for all of us. Father, we pray that you would be with those who are suffering from the virus, 
especially those that uh, have been touched by that here uh, in Uvalde. Uh, we pray that you would be with them, be with their families, and that you pray that you would be upon all of us, uh, protect all of us from, from that virus. Um, as always, Father, we pray uh, that you would protect those who protect us. Uh, what a difficult time it is for our first responders, our firemen, our nurses, doctors, policemen, uh, and, and military folks. We pray that you'd be with them, protect them as they protect us and protect their families. Uh, it's, it's so difficult to have to stay at home uh, and while your loved one is out uh, defending. And we pray that you'd be with those as well. Father, once again, we pray a great prayer of thanksgiving for that ultimate gift that you gave us, uh, sending your son Jesus to die on that cross for forgiveness of our sins. What a wonderful, wonderful thing you have done. In Jesus' heavenly name we pray, amen. Our next song is 823, 823 if you'd like to follow in the songbook. We'll sing uh, two songs, two songs, and we'll turn it over uh, to the, the one who's going to be leading our thoughts and prayers uh, concerning the Lord's Supper. So we'll sing this in one more. Just a reminder, too, that the, the fruit of the vine and eleven cups are in the, uh, in the, in the foyer if uh, you need to, still need to grab, a, grab some. 823. This song has a bass lead in the, in the chorus. Count on you. Lead me gently home, Father. Lead me gently home. When my sorrows are ended and parting days have come, sin no more shall tempt me. Ne'er from the hour.
770, 770. We'll try to do the four verses. If I keep up with which verse I'm on. Always thought I'd like the baseball counter. Click. <coughs> Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Reclothe us in our rightful mind and cure lies thy service by. And deep reverence praise in simple trust like theirs who heard beside the Syrian sea the gracious calling of the Lord led us like them without a word rise up. And follow thee, O Sabbath rest by Galilee, O calm of hills above, where Jesus knelt to share with thee the silence of eternity. Drop thy still dews of quietness till all our striving cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the Grace, peace, love, and mercy be to each of you through our Lord and Savior Christ Jesus. Those aren't just empty words. Those are words that I really mean. And our world certainly needs more grace and love and peace today. Amen. You know, we as, uh, as humans, God in all of His love and mercy knew that we would be forgetful people we can look at the Old Testament and we see how many times the Israelites forgot God and he had to remind them and so because we are forgetful God instituted the Lord's Supper as it says in remembrance of him if we didn't partake of the Lord's Supper then perhaps we would not remember him as much as we should and as much as we need to. And so we come this morning to partake of the Lord's Supper, to partake of the bread which represents His body and the fruit of the vine which represents His blood that was shed for our sins. So let us always keep that foremost in our minds. We need to know that it's something we need to do out of reverence. You know, if we were to attend a memorial service for a family member or a friend, you know, we wouldn't laugh and giggle and, you know, do things that would show disrespect. And the same is true of the Lord's Supper. We need to be respectful and to keep that in our minds. Would you bow with me, please? Most loving, gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you again this morning just thanking you for it everything that you have done for us. We're just so thankful that you are our Father and that you have allowed us to be your dear children. We thank you so much for Christ Jesus and for that sacrifice he made upon the cross for the forgiveness of our sins and to 
to institute the new covenant under which we live today. And Father, as we partake of this bread, which represents his body that he willingly gave upon the cross, we just pray that each one of us will reflect on that and that we will partake of it in a manner that brings glory and honor to your name. It's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, as we continue our thanks for the cup which represents the blood that was shed by Christ Jesus for our sins, we're just so thankful for that willing sacrifice that he gave upon the cross so that we could have the forgiveness of sin and we could have life and have it more abundantly. We pray that as we partake of this, do so that we bring glory and honor to your name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We'll sing three, uh, sorry, we'll sing 895, 895 as we, uh, uh, let's stand please, those who would like to dismiss to the Spanish study with our brother Jose Pettis, uh, the opportunity to do so at this time, please, and then we'll turn it over to brother Tim here in the main, main auditorium. 895, the first and last verse, first and last verse. I'd like to stay here longer than man's allotted days And watch the fleeting changes of life's uneven ways But if my Savior calls me to that sweet home on high I'll live with Him forever in glory by and by Oh yes, I'll live in glory by and by I'll tell and sing the story there on high there with my dear Redeemer, no more to die. Oh yes, I'll live in glory by and by. The end I know is nearing, by faith I look away. To yonder home supernal, the land of endless day. I'll cling to him forever, and look beyond the sky. And live with him forever, and glory by and by. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory, by and by. I'll tell and sing the story, there on high. There with my dear Redeemer, no more to die. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory, by and by. If you'd like to mark books, 202, 202. Happy Father's Day to everybody. Uh, it's, a, it's a blessed day. I chose to wear my Father's Day gift for you, uh, which turns out to be perfect for our lesson. So I, normally I told him, he's like, I can get used to 
preaching in a t-shirt and khakis. I was like, this is nice. She's like, don't get used to it. Uh, anyway, so nonetheless, uh, it just seems appropriate. I thought I would start off by showing a clip, um, making sure that Mark has time to get that up. Uh, a clip and that dads are often compared to this particular character. And so we're going to a little one, one and a half minute video, and then we'll get going. Are you, are you ready? All right, Tola, knock out the lights, buddy. <laughs> Now I'm just going to look in the dark. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. So you got to wait back there in case for when it's over. It'll like go back on. Give it just a minute. If not, Mark will just move on and we'll do it. It worked earlier. It worked earlier. <laughs> That's all right, tell hit the lights, buddy. Well, now I feel just silly standing here in my Superman shirt. <laughs> I did put it on. Oh, look, Mark, pull up the slide. Uh, how many of you guys have seen the movie Man of Steel? All right, there you go. That was the video clip that we were going to watch. Man of Steel, Superman, uh, how he is. He turns himself over to, to the government, and he kind of surrenders to them. And Lois Lane looks at his shirt, and she says... S. What's S stand for? Do you guys remember that part? And he says, it's not an S. Uh, in my world, it stands for, do you guys remember? It stands for hope. It stands for hope. Uh, and so the title of today's lesson is Fathers Who Give Hope. And I think that's appropriate. Our text is fairly straightforward and simple this morning. Do we have a PowerPoint at all? We do. It's just coming. Okay. We'll work on it. Uh, Fairly straightforward and simple. Colossians chapter 3, verse 21. I almost thought Ephraim was going to read this verse, which would have been fine. Simple. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. I mean, it divides pretty easily, doesn't it? Three main parts. You have first, you have the address, you have fathers. Then you have second, there's the command, do not embitter your children. And then third, there's the purpose of the command, or they will become discouraged. There you go, there's Superman, I don't look like him. Uh, so right here, we have a nice three-part sermon. You guys can figure that out from Colossians 3.21. Fathers, do not embitter your children, or they will become discouraged. And as I begin, I think it's worth taking a few minutes and talking about our Heavenly Father. We already talked about that. Ephraim did a really good job getting our minds focused on that. I mean, it's Father's Day after all. And so it seems appropriate to look at our Father in heaven, the fatherhood of God. The Lord's Prayer. Jesus teaches his disciples. He says, when you pray, go to a room, close the door when you're by yourself. And it says, and he says, pray like this. Our what? Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. God is the Father of those who are led by the Spirit. Listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 9, and then we'll skip down to verse 14. It says, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. And let's skip down to verse 14. For, for those who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirits that we are children of God. And this is a really neat verse. And among other things, Paul is saying that as a Christian, if you claim to be a Christian, if you have the Spirit, then God is your Father. And it's that neat. And his Spirit lives in you. And that means you have this freedom, this ability to go before God the Father with anything that you need. And like a good dad... That does not mean that you will get anything you ask for. But it does also mean that God will look out for you. 
that God hears you, that God has your best interest at heart. And so let's pause and think about that for a minute. Think about the ideal father. Okay. Now I know that not everybody had an ideal father. Some of you guys grew up where your father seemed distant or, or just kind of away from it and you have broken families and we get that. But, but pause and think about what an ideal father might look like. If we, I wish we could ask that question in a Bible class. And then we could share and I could take those answers and put them on a whiteboard, kind of like a collage and so forth. Each of one of us has a mental picture of what a father is supposed to look like. And the neat thing is that Scripture starts trying to give us a picture of this ideal father, as Ephraim really did a good job of getting our minds ready. What is God the Father like? And, and there's so many more things that we could possibly fit into a sermon this morning. We could talk about a lot of different things, but not in any kind of detail. Things like this. Our Father, our Heavenly Father, is a giver of good gifts. Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. If then you... Though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more? How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? Our Father is working hard. We just read in, in excuse me, Romans chapter 8 how our Father is in heaven and by the Spirit we're able to cry out, Abba, Father. And in that same context of God being our Father, it says in verse 28, in all things God, or you can say in all things our Father, works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. Two more. Let's look in the Old Testament. Uh, Ephraim did mention this one. Psalm 103, verse 13. As a father has compassion on his children... So the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. So right there we have this picture of God being our Father, and He is this compassionate Father, this tender and compassionate God who loves us towards His children. Here's one that we know, but oftentimes this one can be a little bit difficult. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 through 12 starts off saying this, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. And do not resent his rebuke. So right there, we have to realize that God is a God who does give good gifts like we saw in Matthew. But he's also a God who disciplines. He's a God who rebukes. But we can't just leave it there. You have to finish that thought. And so it says back up, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because... Because the Lord disciplines those he loves. As a father, the son he delights in. And so right there you have this picture of God. Yes, he disciplines. Yes, he rebukes. But he does it out of love. He loves us and he delights in us and his children so much. He loves us so much that he's like, I won't let you just go down that path and just be distant from you. Rather, he's going to intervene. He's going to try to guide and lead us in the right ways. God wants us to grow as people. And so he's going to try to steer us in those directions. You guys know that there's so many more pictures about God. God being a forgiving God, right? God being a God who has patience towards us. Do you dads ever need patience and forgiveness? Yeah. You need it in your own personal life because if you're honest, you realize that you've messed up, haven't you, as a dad? You've tried to do things and you've botched it big time. And so you need your kids to be patient with you. But man, you need to also be patient with your kids sometimes, right? And so it works both ways. But that is what God is. God is forgiving. God is patient. God is a God who does other things. He gives us strength and courage, something that we're going to talk about in just a moment. And so as we look and we start off this lesson, we look at our Father in heaven. Because if we do not understand who God is as our Father, then we miss who we are supposed to be as earthly and spiritual fathers on earth. If you don't see God clearly as our Father, then you have no idea who you are supposed to be. All human fathers are to model the pattern that God has set. And so the overarching, overarching guide for every father should be to live in a way that his children see who God is. 
And that right there is awesome and it's humbling because that means you and I have a picture. And when your kids look at you, my kids look at me, they're trying to see who is God like. And man, that can be scary, terrifying. But that could also be such a cool thing because you have an opportunity to represent God in such a very unique and special way. And as a human father, that's our reflection. You are showing your children something, albeit oftentimes it is a very imperfect reflection. But somehow you are teaching them about who our Heavenly Father is. And another reason why I think it's relevant to begin talking about the fatherhood of God is, is that everyone in this room and everybody watching, whether you are a good dad or not, whether you had a good dad or not, you have a father who is completely perfect in every way. And so today, like every other Sunday, but today especially, we try to honor our father in heaven. And that's significant. So when Paul begins his address, fathers... We remember that that was a title given to our Heavenly Father before Paul came around. And whether we have kids or not, all of us, and I include men and women in this, all of us are to point people to our Heavenly Father. But now let's look at the rest of the verse. And I actually want to begin with the last phrase, uh, the purpose of Paul's command. First, kind of that goal that, that's there. And I think once we have the eye, our eyes on that goal, then we'll be able to understand the command a little bit better. And so it says, Fathers, do not embitter your children, or, or they will become discouraged. So let's focus on that last part. Or they will become discouraged. What does that mean? A goal of Christian fathers is to raise children who are not discouraged. Oh, that's exactly what Paul is saying. And discouraged, what does that mean? It means to lose heart, disheartened, dispirited, to, to be broken in spirit, to, to really, it means to give up on life in so many ways. And since Paul gives us, and this is really significant, since Paul gives us this negative to avoid, okay, the negative is don't discourage them. Since Paul gives us this negative to avoid, I believe that the positive is actually implied in this verse. And so we say, we don't want them just to not be discouraged. Rather, we want them to be the opposite of discouraged. And what is that? What's the opposite of discouraged? Well, discouraged, when I think about, I think about something like we've been talking about, somebody who's hopeful, somebody who is filled with joy. Discouraged literally means to take away courage, Right? And so the opposite of that would be to give courage, to give that confidence, to, to encourage. At times in Scripture, like I believe here, a command to avoid something negative is also implied to pursue something positive. And I think that's so significant because Paul is not saying, I want you to just avoid being this kind of father and everything else is good. Rather, they say, Avoid being that kind of father. Avoid being the kind of father that discourages and look in this direction. Pursue this kind of fatherhood that seeks to encourage, that seems to give hope and joy and courage in your children's lives. So don't just focus on the negative to be avoided. Focus on the thing to pursue. And let's pause for a minute and think about that on a general scale. No parent, at least no decent parent, sets out with the intention of discouraging their children, do they? Most parents, even those who do not care or, or believe in God at all, most parents would like their kids to have hope and courage, wouldn't they? That's pretty standard. And so when Paul, so listen, in our text, is Paul simply saying, follow the world's standard by that? No, of course not. The hope and the joy, the courage that Paul wants us to instill in our kids is not just found in everyday stuff, is it? Where does he want their hope to be? He wants them to be in God. And so think about it like this. Paul is not saying, I want your kids to be free or have freedom from discouragement and to have hope in the fact that maybe someday they will be famous. 
Paul doesn't say, don't let them be discouraged. Rather, help them have hope and someday become wealthy or intellectual or married or successful or someone. That's not at all what Paul's talking about. And so when Paul gives that other thing, he says, man, I, it should be obvious, right? He wants our hope to come in God. And so think about joy for a minute. Uh, joy being the opposite of discouragement. Paul would not be content. Paul wouldn't be content if a father simply tries to avoid discouragement by making their kids happy in a way that just gives them whatever they want. Of course Paul's not going to be content with that. That might be a worldly standard, this idea that, you know what, there are some kinds of happiness, let's say this, that have nothing to do with God whatsoever. And so Paul's not saying, avoid that at all costs. Rather, he's trying to point us in a different direction. Or think about encouragement. The world says that we should, that we should try to build up our children's self-confidence, doesn't it? And that sounds pretty good in some ways. But Scripture teaches us something very different. Because self-confidence focuses in on what? Self. I mean, that's where self-confidence is. It's a focus on myself that I can do it. But rather, Scripture says something very different. We could call it maybe God confidence. But look at this passage. This is 2 Corinthians. I don't know if I can turn there. 2 Corinthians. Ooh, not that one. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 8. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. You mean, you talk about being discouraged. That sounds like terrible discouragement, right? He feels like he is going to die again. We've got this sentence of death on our lives. But listen to this. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves. This happened so that we wouldn't develop this self-confidence in ourselves that, man, we can do this. Rather, but it's so that we would rely on God. Listen to this four times. Who raised us from the dead? He has delivered us from such a deadly peril. And he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. Over and over this passage, Paul was saying, it's not about us. That confidence, it shouldn't be in you. That confidence should look up to God and we should be able to see God our Father and be confident in him. So remember our first definition of hope some time ago. It's been several weeks, hasn't it? Our first definition of hope was Confident expectation. But not just random, does it? It's confident expectation in, in God. God was working in Paul's life. Listen to this, this is so significant. Paul was working in, or excuse me, God was working in Paul's life to root out any kind of remnant of self confidence so that it could be replaced. By courage, by hope, by confidence in the Lord. It's never been about self-confidence. And so you fathers and father figures, don't discourage your children. Or, or how about this? Don't, don't merely try to make them happy. Don't, don't settle for self-confidence, trying to instill that in your children. Rather, seek to fill them with joy in God and to put their confidence in the Lord. When our kids are struggling... Instead of one of the guy things we want to do is try to go help them and fix things. When our kids are struggling, we don't run, first of all, to try to fix them. Rather, we pray with them. Rather, we seek to assure them that God is working. We seek to encourage them to hold on to Christ all the more. Because no matter how terrible the world is, God is faithful. People will let you down. You will let yourself down because you cannot have control over every aspect of your life. And so rather when our kids are struggling, we teach them to look towards God the Father because He is the one who's faithful. 
He's the one with the strength. He's the one with the power to overcome whatever obstacles in our life. And because of who Christ is, because of Him working all things out for the good of those who love Him, we can even have joy in the middle of those situations because God loves us. Because He's very real. He's very present and He is working. And so I think, I think that is a good, or excuse me, that's the goal that Paul is trying to get at. And so when you read that phrase, or they will become discouraged, in some ways you could say that's shorthand for this other goal of putting our hope and our confidence and our joy in the Father. And now we'll get to the command. Back up a little bit in that verse. Fathers, do not embitter your children. And again, we see that, that focus on a negative command, right? Don't do this. And so just like in the other part, there's going to be this focus rather on the positive, on the pursuing this. It's not good enough to avoid the negative. Now you've got to fill your life, right? Uh, Jesus talks about that, doesn't he? Don't just get rid of the evil spirit. Otherwise, it's going to go around, it's going to come back, and it's going to be worse than before, right? It's not good enough to try to avoid the negative. Uh, we've got to pursue something. And so think about that as we go through this part. And this is a warning, really, because right before this, you get to verse 20 that says, Children, obey your parents in everything, in everything, for this pleases the Lord. And you think about that verse, that gives parents in, in general just this tremendous authority and responsibility over their kids. If they're supposed to submit to you in everything, children are or to do what their parents say. And we're going to save that sermon for Children's Day, right? Uh, but now you get to verse 21. And in light of that command for children, he is cautioning fathers against the misuse or abuse of that God-given authority. And the misuse he has in mind is that fathers will somehow treat their children in a harsh way or some way that it will break their children's spirits or they will become hopelessly discouraged. And Paul could have used a more specific word here. Ephraim mentioned uh, Ephesians, right? Was it Ephesians 5 or 6? I think one of those things. Uh, Ephesians. And in Ephesians, he says, Fathers, don't provoke. And the word there that Paul uses there is a very specific word. It's a little bit more focused, okay? It's a little bit more uh, a rigid word than the one he uses here. The one he uses here really is a general, general word. It doesn't have those strong feelings. And I believe Paul is using it very intentionally because he doesn't want us to get so focused on one kind of thing that can discourage our children by saying don't embitter them. Rather, that word that he uses is so general and the idea is that he wants us to avoid anything and everything that seems like it will ruin our child's confidence in God. Leaving him discouraged in the Lord. And that requires a lot of wisdom. Because you know that not all short-term discouragement will lead to long-term hopelessness. Oh, we just saw that, right? In 2 Corinthians, God allowed short-term discouragement in Paul so that Paul would actually develop a long-term hope or long-term confidence in God. But let me say this. There are things that fathers can do that will have long-term consequences. There are a lot of negative things. But, but I want to close on this one. And you can read it as negative or you can read it as positive, however you want to put it. One of the big things that lead to discouragement is that some fathers fail to be joyful and hopeful and confident in God. It is a hard thing to teach something that you are not. Who are you in relationship with God is so much more significant than any particular parenting style you could try to figure out. Will your children hope in God if you hope in retirement? For the day when you can kind of live your life however you want, free from those responsibilities. Will your children learn to hope in God 
If they see your hope being, man, the day when I can actually live for myself instead of going to work nine to five. Well, will your children be joyful in God if they see that the river brings a more joyful experience than worship? Will your children learn to be confident in God when your whole demeanor communicates this desire to be seen as somebody who has it all together? If you want to embitter your children, then put your hope and your joy and your confidence in anything other than God. But, but if you want to do as Paul says, the single most important work that a father can do for the sake of his children is to be an imitator of God. To be a man whose hope and joy and confidence and courage are in God and not himself. And scripture teaches us just that. Uh, we are taught to imitate our heavenly father. Peter will say in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 16, he quotes Leviticus in the Old Testament. He says, you know what you're supposed to be? You're supposed to be holy. Not just before holiness, sake, but you're supposed to be holy as God is holy. And Jesus, Jesus told us, he says, you know what? You're supposed to be merciful as your father or as God is merciful. That's Luke 6, verse 36. And Paul will say this, he says, follow my example, not because of who I am, because I follow the example of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. And so over and over, if you are a child, if your children are going to grow and to know who Christ is, then it doesn't start in Bible class. It starts by your example. And I know right now we're having a hard time because we want to have Bible classes here. But let me tell you, there's an opportunity here. Because you have an opportunity, not just when Bible class is going on here, but you have a much greater opportunity to teach your kids about Christ by your example, by how you live, by who you are pursuing, who you are in front of God. For those of you who have been around kids, you know, uh, you've seen this, you know that kids love to dress up in their parents' clothing, don't they? Uh, not too long ago, my kids came out, they had my jacket on and my pants and, and shoes, and they kind of come out, you know, waddling really out because they can't even walk, and they're just laughing and giggling, and they think it's absolutely hilarious, and it really was, we were just laughing, but besides the fact that it's just funny sometimes, there's some truth to that, isn't there? Kids look to their parents as a model. As a model for who they should be. And then think about this. Let's say in our careers. Firefighters. I've been told a lot of firefighters are people who have dads who are also firefighters. Not everyone, but a lot of them are. That there's something in that when they watch their dad do that job, there's something in them that just, man, kind of desires. Man, that sounds cool. That's something I want. And so the dad's modeling something, and the kids are following that. I know in my personal experience, my dad is a preacher. And my dad went on several mission trips. And so now my sister and I both are in ministry full time. And I've got another brother who's going to school right now studying so that he can be a preacher. And I've got two other brothers who have done short-term mission trips. We witnessed, we watched our dad who tremendously influenced our lives. To be a good child of our Heavenly Father is to copy him as our dad. And as we copy him, we instill those same principles in our children. There are no guarantees that they will follow. But that is the absolute best way to lead. So the most important question a father can ask is not what should I teach my children or something along those lines. Rather, it is do I model my heavenly father to my children? Fathers bear a very special relationship, a very uh, a special responsibility for the spiritual life of the family. 
And so I challenge you to take that responsibility seriously. Be the kind of man who gives hope, joy, and confidence to your children because, because you yourself have found hope and joy and confidence in God. If we can bless you in some ways, let us know. We're going to stand and sing our song. I have an invitation. So if you need anything, let us know while we're singing our song. Randy? Mark will do one and four. One and four. <clears throat> joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt stuff going on. She's getting married in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and uh, where her grandma is, they share staff with another uh, nursing home area, and two of their staff, was a staff or residents, uh, tested positive for COVID-19. And so since they share staff, I mean, that, that can be a, that can be a scary thing, uh, especially for her grandma. Her grandma, if you don't know, uh, more like a mom than anything to her. And so it's a, it's a difficult thing, as well as with the wedding coming up. You know, she wants, she wants her mom to probably be there more than almost anybody else. And so we'll just have to see how that plays out. So we're going uh, to pray for that, and then uh, we will be dismissed. Do you want to close us in a prayer also while you're up here? Okay. Okay. And we won't worry about our Bible. Well, why don't you? Just stay up here real quick. You can close this out. I just, this is important stuff sometimes, guys. I don't mean to come up and interrupt at the end and have everybody stay another. But when uh, things happen with our family, we just want you to know, and sometimes we forget. And, uh, Jim, thank you guys so much for entrusting us with the idea of your daughter. She will be prayed for, believe me, okay? That's important. Ruth, Stephen, unbelievable, guys. Y'all will be in our prayers. That's just powerful. But I wanted to bring up uh, Stephen Irene. Their son, Matthew, just retired from the Marines. Uh, Navy. After, Navy. Navy. I'm so, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Superman Navy, yeah. And uh, so in 20 years, he just arrived back in Texas yesterday. Yesterday. So it's just, that stuff is so important. And so just keep them in your prayers. But if you have anything ever, please. Let us know, because we will pray for you. Thank you, Tim. Let's pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we come to you, and uh, so many things on our minds, on our hearts, and each one of us has certain burdens that, that we carry. And Father, your word tells us that we are. We, we are to carry our own burdens. And at the same time, that same uh, passage in Galatians, you tell us to carry one another's burdens. And Father, what better way than to carry one another's burdens and lift up one another to you in prayer. And so we pray for, uh, 
for one another, as Dan mentioned. You know, and we seek your blessing in our lives, that we will be like you, that we will learn to follow your example, Father. You, Paul writes, follow God's example as dearly loved children. And walk in that way of love, Father, that command to be like you. So God, as we go forward, I pray that you will help us to point others to you uh, this week. That we will walk in hope and joy and confidence because you are God. And we can imitate your character. And Father, I want to close specifically praying for Lynn, that you will watch over her. Father, she's, she's nervous, she's scared uh, for different things, just for, for her grandma more than anything. And there's just a lot of emotions and pressure right now as things are getting closer and closer to the wedding. Uh, Father, watch over them. Give them, uh, give them strength to overcome. I pray that you will give them peace. Because you are God and you are in control. And so, Father, watch over them. I pray for health for those residents and uh, specifically right now for her grandma. I know she desires so much to have her grandma there to witness everything. And, uh, Father, I know that that will be a positive thing if she's able to come. Uh, and it will be so meaningful to her on a very deep level. And so I pray that you will uh, bless her and grant her with that. But God, we also know that you are God and that you are in control. And so uh, help us to hold on to you, to put our faith in you above everything else and to allow you to work in, in ways that you do best. God, we love you and we thank you for entrusting us to be imitators of you. Thank you for allowing us to share in your nature and allowing us the opportunity to reflect your glory. God, be with us today as we do that. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.